Hello, everyone. I'm Kate Golden. I'm Bay Nature's digital editor. Welcome to today's Bay Nature chat with Debbie Vies about two heavy hitters in the Bay Area mushroom scene, California golden chanterelles and death caps and am Amanita phylloides. Bay Nature is a nonprofit. <coughs> Excuse me. We're a nonprofit independent media organization that produces environmental journalism covering the San Francisco Bay Area. We publish the quarterly Bay Nature magazine, plus weekly stories online, a weekly email newsletter, and our, of course, our social media channels. Now, Bay Nature talks and other events like this one are how we bring our stories to life and connect you more deeply with experts in the field. Now, having Debbie is a real treat because she is in the field a lot and she knows her stuff. Today's chat, covers our, one of our most beloved edible mushrooms and one that is deadly poisonous. We have fame and infamy. We have beauty and the beast all in one lunch hour. So we will talk about sex and poison and science and food. Get ready. Before we get started, a bit of housekeeping. If you have any technical difficulties, just relax. We're recording everything and we'll send out a link after the event. And you no, know, this is a chat, not one of our formal talks. We capped the registration so that people could get some questions in. Pretend we're all sitting around a table together. Please leave your camera on. If you have any questions, raise your Zoom hand or your actual hand. Um, I am not terrific at multitasking, to be perfectly honest, but my colleague Christine is here to help me notice you, and I appreciate your patience. So I'll ask some questions of Debbie, and then I'll stop periodically to call on people. And together we will sprinkle the questions throughout like spores in the forest. Um, first, we will talk about chanterelles, then we will bring in the death caps, and later we will talk about what happens when we find them in the woods. So save your foraging questions for the end. Um, I just, I wanna also thank everyone who either made a $20 donation to support today's talk or became a new member. Bay Nature, we get half of our income from donations, and your gifts make these events possible. We invite you to donate at baynature.org, and if you're not a member yet, signing up is how you get our gorgeous print magazine, early access to events, and a whole lot more. So I am now delighted to introduce Debbie Wies, the co-founder of the Bay Area Mycological Society. Debbie is a zoologist, a naturalist, and a mycologist who was seduced away from the furred and feathered by the wonderful world of fungi. She loves to document, photograph, illustrate, write, and talk about mushrooms and eat them. She is the co-founder of the Bay Area. My, oh, excuse me, I said that. I met her when I called her about doing this article on chanterelles and I got kind of a twofer because it turned out she also knew a ton about the genus Amanita and mushroom toxicology. So welcome, Debbie. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. You want to start by introducing us to our new state mushroom, Cantharellus californicus, the gold in the hills. Where do they live? Um, what are they like? Sure. Um, for those of you here today who have foraged mushrooms, it's likely that you have encountered our California chanterelle, which is remarkably the largest chanterelle species in the world. But for a long time, all of the chanterelles in North America were called by the European name Cantharellus sibarius. And if you go into some of the older literature, you'll see every single chanterelle, no matter how large it was, where it grew, or what it looked like was called sibarius. So slowly, we're starting to tease out what we actually have here in North America. Where do they live and, and what are they like compared to other kinds of chanterelles? Well, our California chanterelle is particularly chunky. So some chanterelles are quite <laughs> delicate, but this thing is massive, right? I mean, they, they can get literally this big, like bigger than my head, which is a remarkable size for a chanterelle. Our California chanterelle glow, grows exclusively with oak trees. We do have a couple other chanterelle species that grow with conifers and different sorts of hardwoods. Um, and this is their season. It's been a spectacular season this year, but not every year is like this. So if you just started mushrooming this year, I have to give you the bad news that it's not like this every year. 
Why are they so big? Um, well, they continuously grow for months at a time, certainly weeks, um, and they continue to add on more layers of fertile surface underneath that cap. So they just keep growing and growing and growing and growing until eventually they're just beaten down by wear, animals trampling them, or too much rain will, you know, wear them away. But Do you know if growing. they're, like you said, that's the, the fertile surface keeps growing? Like, are they reproducing as long as they're, you know, the bigger they get, the more spores they make? Does anyone yes, know? Yes, pretty much. Um, so they, they actually let add, which is unusual among mushrooms, they add more, at least among, eh, these are quasi-gilled mushrooms. They keep adding more layers of fertile surface as they grow. So um, it's not a once and done, like most of our mushrooms, they open their caps, they shed their spores, that's it. In a way, they're kind of like, they remind me of halibut, that the biggest female habit, halibut are also like the huge breeders. Like they're just, you know, the older they are, the more they put out and the more the they more reproduce. They lay. The yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, sure. But exactly. even the little ones, once, once they open and produce that fertile surface, they'll start producing spores. Mm -hmm. But the thing it actually reminds me of um, in the in how it grows is the tomatoes that, you know, you have your determinate tom tomatoes that you can put in a pot and they'll stay nice and well behaved. And then you have your indeterminate ones that the more you feed them, the more they grow. Is it like the same kind of process uh, at work? It, it, it seems almost analogous, but but you're talking about the vegetative portion of the tomato growing and the so-called there's not really a it's not vegetative because mushrooms aren't vegetables but the vegetative <laughs> equivalent is the mycelia under the ground so it's it's really that fruit body that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger mm -hmm. though I, some of those beef steaks get pretty damn big too so <laughs> it's true <laughs> you know uh, it's good to remember that like the massive portion of the of the fungus is really underground compared right. to what we ever see fungus. the body of the fungus mm -hmm. is hidden we just see the fruit bodies where they're producing spores mm -hmm. why do you think it took so long to distinguish our california chanterelle from the european and other varieties around here um because the the original colonizers of north america had a european tradition so they went out in the field, they saw, it's the kind of sorta science. Oh, this looks kind of sorta what I already know. So it must be that. And there were similarities, of course, I can travel all over the world and, and recognize a genus, but the species are a lot trickier. And so, you know, I think people were probably always a little wondering what we really had all along but but with the advent of dna and the ability to really look at the the genetic character of these creatures we could see that they were clearly separated and it wasn't just the macromorphology which even within a single species can vary widely take humans for instance mm -hmm. my sense is that mycology like part of it was that mycology is just like a tiny field in terms of who's doing it That's and then exactly you know right. yeah and and then with these dna te techniques it seems like all over the kingdom you know the taxonomy is just blowing up right everything we knew was wrong or almost <laughs> everything or a, a good bit of it at any rate like i think i learned recently that like the morel family is is just like has ex is among those that have exploded <laughs> <laughs> right. We're looking a lot more deeply and a lot of people mm. are looking at it. So, so the edible fungi get more attention and more funding. So the more funding you get, the more science you can do. True. But is, it, is anyone actually researching the golden chanterelle? Apart from people trying to figure out how to um, you know, grow it in the lab? There, there, were, there have been um, some publications out of Oregon on chanterelles, not the California one but the Formosa and uh, David Aurora, you know, wrote up a pretty extensive piece in economic botany back in 2008. So this is the magazine for the New York Botanical Gardens. And it's really about plants, right? And David Aurora managed to buttonhole the editors and, and say, hey, let's do a mushroom volume. 
And he did. So within that volume is where he published a Californicus. But other researchers all over the country are starting to publish more and more local species of chanterelles because none of them here are sabarius. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, you know, and one of the things I notice about mycology being such a small field is that it feels like there's a very fun strain to it. Like, um, you know, that description, I don't think it's just Aurora, who's kind of famously a uh, whimsical writer, but like he included that photo of, that you took of your friend with the giant chanterelle as like one of the official photos in the scientific description in economic botany. And I just don't know another field where something like that would happen. Well, <laughs> Can you tell fact, us the story of that photo? <laughs> well, yo, of course. So, so in fact, David called our house and he knew that we had been pulling huge chanterelles locally. And so he said, can you get a photo of a really big one for me? Because we knew he was going to be publishing this species. So we had a whole refrigerator of these chanterelles. And that big one that you saw in that photo um, was the one we trotted out every time we had a guest. We said, hey, check out this wonderful chanterelle. So our friend Kathy Aubron was over and I took that picture of her. And uh, I mean, if you read the Bay Nature article, you can see it but I could probably mm -hmm. show you here. So David didn't choose to publish it in color, but you can see how enormous it is. It's even bigger than your octopus. Right, no, it's on, the, it's on her really shoulder. Enormous. So, so we had plenty of pictures of, of pickers, colorful pickers out in the wild picking these chanterelles, but he really wanted to show how big they really got. What did you do with that? that one mushroom that was in the photo? Um, well, we eventually processed and ate them all. So, so it, it is a dilemma because woman cannot live on mushrooms alone. And that, I mean, literally that would feed a family a lot of mushrooms. with leftovers, which is kind of my joke. Now they're not all that big, you know, so I exaggerated for effect. But um, so one thing that I really like to do with these things, because they're monsters, how much can you eat? If I chop them really fine, and then I get a wok, and I put hot oil in them, and I throw them in by handfuls, and I make chanterelle bacon with them. So that just cooks them oh, down. Yeah. And they taste like bacon. So they're great. So you have vegans over for dinner, and you can throw that right on top of your spinach salad. Right, because they have so much umami. That's funny, because I always think of them as being kind of delicate and apricotty, but that takes them to a whole, like more on the umami side. Well, well, some kind of, of the cool. species are more apricotty than the Californicus. California. Maybe I'm more used to the East Coast ones. Yeah, they're different. They're all different. They all taste a little bit different. The red chanterelles on the East Coast taste peppery, and I actually like them the best out of all of them. <laughs> um. Well, one thing I, I wanted to make sure that people know you should ask questions, like raise your hand if you have a question and um, Christina will help you help me find you or you can put your question in the chat. Um, but what, what's the difference between a good year and a not so good year for the chanterelles? Um, well, sometimes you go out and you see nothing. That's a bad year. I mean, but, what, so, so, but like so, what causes a good year? Okay, so rain of course is a big factor but we could have rain next year and not see a lot of chanterelles so it takes a lot of energy from both the mushroom and the tree to make those fruit bodies so they have pretty much exhausted themselves this year and it's not going to happen next year even if it rains now the mushrooms always like to prove me wrong I make a liar out of me. But I predict that we will not have another year like this one, mm -hmm. even if we have good rains. Early rains help too. So we had rains in September this year, and maybe even in the summer. I mean, I'm not charting this. And what happens when we get an early rain is the primordia for those incipient mushrooms get set on the mycelia and then all it takes is more rain so we were starting to see chanterelles in september and they'll probably run all the way through march mm, so really amazing what a year yeah it's really remarkable mm. 
Do the mushrooms, what is the relationship between the mushrooms and the trees that they live under or with? Well, it's a, it's a mutualistic relationship. So we don't know exactly how it works, but the, the mushroom mycelia penetrates those root hairs and forms another organism called a mycorrhizae. And, and they are then able to exchange nutrients and pass along water to that tree. But how that is regulated, we don't really know. So we don't know who's the controlling partner and if it's if it's a partnership or sometimes you know somebody takes a little more somebody you know the tree might just cut them off so the tree provides sugars through photosynthesis the the fungi cannot eat basically without that tree providing sugar so what the fungus has to do is provide dissolved minerals and water but how balanced that is we really don't know I wonder if it's just like, you know, the way that our human relationships, sometimes, you know, you are the person who's giving more and sometimes you're the person who's taking more. If right. it's a little it bit like that. Be like that. And, and you know, every, every plant, every fungus is an individual. They're an individual. And every individual mm -hmm. is in it for themselves, right? So they might, they might get a nice tree. They might be a mean fungus. I mean, we, I mean, of course, I'm, you know, anthropomorphizing <laughs> here, but, but they have, I mean, they have their own reason to live and desire to succeed so it's not really this wonderful peaceable kingdom where everything oh please no you first oh no no you first i don't really think that's how the fungal plant interaction works mm, but sometimes generosity or what looks like alt altruism can be in an individual's best interest so that's yeah true. yeah you never know you never um, know and <laughs> Any questions? I'll just pause to see if anyone has asked anything. Okay, um, I I wanted to find out if you have any thoughts on what we as a society, either as a society or as individuals, should should be doing to keep our chanterelles happy. <laughs> um, the most important, the weirdly focused question is preserve the oak woodlands. Right. So we can't do much about climate change. We can't do much about drought. Nobody's going out there and hand watering the oak trees. Uh, we can't do much about sudden oak death, with which is a serious pathogen that's been introduced to California, primarily California. Um, but we can fight oak forests being cut down for vineyards and for housing. And mm. we can um, encourage open space being left as open space, not just for the trees and fungi, but for all the creatures that live in these woods, and even for our own selves to have the ability to walk in these woods, because I think it's a very calming and centering thing to be in nature. Mm -hmm. Mm, certainly something that resonates with Bay Nature folks. Um, a question from Leah. Does every type of mushroom have a mutualism with a tree or are chanterelles unique in this way? Um, not every mushroom has mutualism with a tree, but almost every single plant we have looked at has fungus involved in some way. It's not necessarily a mycorrhizal species like a chanterelle where it's attached to the roots. Sometimes it's actually um, in the leaves of the trees and those are called endophytic fungi. And there's there's some kind of fungi that um, called our, bus our buscular fungi that are associated with grasses. So there's many, many complex relationships between fungi and plants. Question from Alana. Alana, do you wanna ask, ask it yourself? You can unmute um, or- sure. Um, I was just wondering when planting any tree, whether or not it's, um, oh, start my video, sorry. <laughs> Here I am. Hi. Um, no. If you're planting a tree, be it a fruit tree or a shade tree or whatever, 
Should we be thinking about what fungus sort of goes with the tree better and then add it somehow as an amendment to the soil? Well, that's a really good question. Um, so there's fungi everywhere and there's fungi in your soil, right? So it's really important to maintain healthy soils. When you buy these mycorrhizal mixes, they're not necessarily something that's going to be suitable to your tree. Right. So the best person to ask that of would probably be an arborist, because yeah. I don't know what really associates with, say, these fruit trees. Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah. it, it's it's hugely beneficial to have a mycorrhizal partner for yeah. trees. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Although not all of them do. Well, okay, so that's so... There's, there's different mycorrhizae. They're ectomycorrhizae or like chanterelles, amanitas, rushulas, things like that. And then there's the arbuscular mycorrhizae and, and they don't really produce fruit bodies, but mm -hmm. they're, still, they're still benefiting the tree. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we want to talk about death caps when we get into the sex and poison and all that stuff? Ooh, like my, Ooh. my buddy behind my shoulder? Yes. Um, now I think we ha we have to address the Amanita in the room. Yes. Um, and you have to explain that this right, is so not this is this is an bit. actual thing. It's a it's a <laughs> this is not just a background. No, it's a beautiful sculpture made by a, a Minnesota artist named mm -hmm. Kim Ford, and we commissioned it initially to hang from the ceiling of Point Reyes National Seashore Bear Valley Visitor Center, was gonna hang there with the whales in that huge ceilinged room. And uh, we got an agreement, the BAMS was going in halfsies, and it was gonna be twice the size of the one behind me. And I was working with artists for a number of weeks and the park said, oh, hey, we decided we don't want to do this anymore. And I'm like, whoa, I've already like, you know, been working with this artist. So I said, I told the artist, look, make it half size and we'll just take it and we'll use it for our uh, our educational things. So so we bring it along to educational events. And my husband set it up behind me for this Zoom. It lives in a huge crate that can be shipped all over the world. Eventually it's going to go to Ann Pringle, our chief, our premier Floydes researcher here in North America, uh, when it, it's in my will to go to Ann. Do you want to go ahead and start talking about death caps? Okay. So um, if you all have been paying attention in the woods or reading newspapers and listening to media, you're probably aware of the death cap and am Amanita Floydes. It causes poisonings every year when it comes up. Again, it's a species that doesn't always have a big bloom year. When they do have a big bloom year though, they're a big, beautiful mushroom and they attract eyes and they attract unwary foragers. And they're also attractive to dogs because um, they have distinctive odors that are attractive. They're, they, initially, they have almost a honeyed odor. And then as they age, they have kind of a, an odor of decay, which all of which is delicious to a dog, right? Dogs love dead things. So um, they're really a public health and pet hazard here in the Bay Area. Um, they're an introduced species. They're not native to California or North America. We believe they were brought in on the roots as a mycorrhizal species of an ornamental cork oak that was brought into the Monterey Hotel back in around 1938. And there, that, of course, the people bringing the tree in didn't realize these mushrooms were on the roots. And that would have been the end of the story, except somehow they escaped from just that too many here. Ar arboretum <laughs> and, and spread all over California. And um, at this point in time, they occur everywhere that there are oaks all the way out to the Channel Islands. Oh my, first of all, I was surprised to realize that the death caps in the Bay Area are the biggest and baddest um, anywhere, or at least the biggest. And why is that? Why are they so happy here? 
Um, it's a very complicated story. So they have a deadly toxin. So a, a lot of animals won't be able to eat them. There are certain insects, um, fungus gnats, that can, but they're in the minority. Certainly mammals that would eat them would die just like we would. Um, and we're not quite sure. So they behave as an invasive here. And they we're, we're learning a few things. So, so it turns out that they're able to make fruit bodies without the mycelia having to meet up with a, a different sex, as it were. So um, a spore is haploid. All spores are haploid. And then they germinate and they grow underground, grow underground. Um, but then they have to meet a compatible sex, as it were. And then they connect. And that's basically how they have sex. And then only those diploid mycelium will create the fruit bodies. So that's dependent upon actually finding that match and sex and fungi is really complicated. So somehow, and only in California, phylloides can sometimes produce their, their mushrooms without having sex, without needing a compatible mycelium. And this is really, really unusual. So that might give them an, an advantage in kind of conquering the world, as it were, here in California. Mm -hmm. I mean, we often talk about um, the ability to have the sex in the haploid way as being advantageous because it gives you genetic diversity that allows you to kind of deal with the challenges that come your way, right? So well, I, it's um, the opposite, I think... actually. It's so, so you want the diploid. So you want two parents. Oh, sorry, that's what I meant to say. Yeah, of course you did. So you want those two parents <laughs> because the more diversity you have in your genes, the more you're able to, you know swing with the world as it swings right um but but on the short term it might actually be an advantage now we don't know how it's going to work in the long term so these fungi haven't been here all that long and um initially we were seeing phylloides start to push out chanterelles and known chanterelle trees so the phylloides are coming in they weren't everywhere initially and there's one two ten twenty thirty forty yvonne could you get yourself thank you so so we sorry have, go ahead so 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 we people that have been hunting chanterelles for a long time in the bay area know their trees know where to go that's why we're all kind of we're not going to tell you where our tree is because it's going to come back but um so we'd go there and all of a sudden we started not seeing chanterelles and seeing just the forest floor covered in phylloides. And that made us think, uh-oh, what's going on here? Are they being pushed out? And that might be the case again in the short term, but every tree has multiple fungi on its roots and somehow they figure out how to timeshare that fruiting and how to, how to decide the tree decides who to give the sugars to. And, and it's very, very complicated and there's lots of players, but just this year, we're starting to see some kind of a pushback where the chanterelles are coming back in areas where we were only seeing phylloides. So it's a dynamic and we're not sure how it's gonna settle out in the future. I think we lost you again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I just lost my second kind of internet. <laughs> so, okay. Well, I can hear it turns you. Out there's no power. So that's good. Um, what, so making, toxins actually we've had a question from leah that i wanted to address leah do you want to ask your question um sure. if you thanks yeah um just both based on the sculpture behind you and uh, just seeing the piece in bay nature the death caps are really 
potent and toxic, but they really look pretty chill. And I was wondering why, um, given that they're really potent and toxic, like why aren't they more brightly colored? Like you would think if like of a more stereotypical toxic mushroom. Right, but not all toxic species are brightly colored. It's just kind of a gift from nature when that happens, right? <laughs> the little warning that, that the phylloides doesn't care if you eat it or not really so much because um, it's so deadly and you're not going to be a problem in the long term, right? So you're not affecting the body of the fungus. You, you might eat a few, a handful of those fruit bodies, but it's not going to affect the long-term ability of that mushroom to survive. Why Why do you think, or what are the theories about why these mushrooms make these toxins? There's a lot of theories about it, but we don't really know. It could just be a byproduct. Um, we really don't know. Mm. There's mm -hmm. no definitive answer on this. What are some of the theories? Uh, to, to, to have an advantage or to prevent predation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it certainly does a pretty good job of preventing predation. You don't predate twice if you're a mammal, for sure. Although supposedly, no. rabbits, can eat them. supposedly rabbits can eat them. So it depends mm -hmm. on the mammal. Turtles can eat them. It's a case by case basis, but I definitely don't advise any humans to eat them. Amatoxin no. is really nasty. Yeah. Um, and how do the amatoxins compare? Maybe tell me if you covered this already, but how do the amatoxins compare to like other toxins that other mushrooms produce? Like, do they all come from some genetically like link? Are they all genetically linked or is it something that happens? Well, they're all, they're all kind of unique, unique toxins mm. that come about, you know, through sometimes through lines. So a, a line of species. So phylloides is just one Amanita that has amatoxins. There's amanitas with amatoxins all over the world, but they're all in a specific section, section phylloidy within the genus Amanita. So they've they've you know they've been slowly evolving over time and, and spreading out and specializing. Uh, there's lots of mushroom toxins, but the amatoxins are the most pernicious and probably the most deadly of all. Question from Lola. Lola, you want to ask? Um, I'm, I'm, I asked if they only grow under oak trees. I'm concerned my family uh, that lives down there has a dog. They walk off and around San Bruno Mountain up there. Right. Um, and and dogs, dogs do get poisoned. And because they have such a low body weight, it's a very dangerous poisoning. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I lost the, 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 what was your question again? Sorry. Uh, in the Bay Area, but would they be found up on San Bruno Mountain on the trail? Oh, okay. So, so they're, um, they came in on oak, cork oak, actually. Uh -huh. And then they jumped to our live oak. And then in about 2006, they jumped to pine and also tan oak. Okay. So they have at least a dozen tree hosts worldwide. So they're very, very good. They are very good at switching hosts. So predominantly you see them with coast live oak, but they you just have to keep your eyes peeled for them. As far okay. as dogs, you want, if your dog is mouthy and is constantly eating random things, you better have that dog on a leash. And if you see that he's eaten a death cap, rapid treatment is, is the key. So get them immediately to a vet, have the vet get them to throw up, and then put that dog right on fluid therapy, which is the number one way to save humans and dogs after an amatoxin poisoning. Okay, thank you. I'll let them know. All right. This is a this is a good time to bring up um, that Debbie, you mentioned that there's a wonderful Facebook group for what happens for the question of what happens if my dog eats a mushroom and I don't know what it is. Yes. So um, take it away. Group is, this group is only in the case 
of an actual ingestion, okay? So this is not, you see a mushroom and you're curious about it. So these are people, about 200 highly trained, both plant and, and fungal experts from all over the world. So there's always somebody online that could answer your question. But this isn't for frivolous things. This is for when you, so the, the animal or your pet or yourself, you've made a mistake, you're frightened. Um, this is the group and I'll hold it up. It's Poisons Help. It's a Facebook group. So you have to actually be a member of Facebook and it's smart to join this group first. So I'll put it up again. It's Poisons Help. If you want to do your screenshots and join it. And then when you need the help, you just post your case and you will have expert mycologists from around the world telling you what the species is that your pet or child or self has eaten. That's pretty cool and a uh, pretty useful. Um, yeah, it's a, one of the few useful things you could get out of Facebook these days, maybe. <laughs> we agree. <laughs> and it's a free service. So nobody, you don't get charged. And because it's a worldwide service, there's always somebody up to answer your call. Yeah. Um, Bridget had a question about IDing death caps. Sure. Um, and what, how would you know what to look for? We also posted some pictures in the chat. Thanks, Christina. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, I will um, just zoom in to my. <laughs> here. Don't so tell here, here I have, hold on, let me see if I can get it. <laughs> All right. This is, <laughs> this isn't working so well. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna back off. So this is a death cap. So death caps can have um, various color from a, a kind of an eerie greenish yellow to pure white, to brown, to tan. They're white gilled. If you look under the cap, they are, they have free gills. So the gills don't quite meet up with that stipe, and I'm not doing a very good job of this. They often like have an annulus. Like I'm where trying. they meet the stalk, they don't so quite. There's, there's an it. annulus or something that was covering the gills when they're younger. You see that feature there. And then they have a bulbous base, which boy, it's hard to do this. See that bulbous base with a sac around it. And that's how you identify a death cap. Now there's other Amanitas here in California, but the death cap has unique features. And they're primarily found in the Bay Area with coast live oak. Um, but if you get out of the Bay Area, you can start seeing them with pine, tan oak. Um, that's pretty much it. Cork oak. And Yeah, and maybe describe how like the Amanitas grow from something very egg-like. You can, if you find a bunch of them at once, you may even be so lucky as to find a, a baby Amanita in the right. works. So Amanitas are, when they're first growing, are covered by something called a universal veil. So that entire baby mushroom is like in an egg. Now the, the death cap, so we have lots of Amanitas here in the Bay Area and quite a few of them are choice edible species, but you have to be very, very careful as a forager. So the deadly Amanitas have their base bigger than the top. So that's one cue. And then as they come out, as you can see over my shoulder, that base forms a cup. So as that universal veil breaks, and punches through, then the bottom of that egg is wrapped around a bulbous base. And they have white gills, white spores, and they're often kind of that greenish yellow color. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask, I, get, uh, first of all, I should say, if anybody has any last few questions we'll be wrapping up here pretty soon um but i wanted to ask you know i know you have this abiding interest in amanitas and the amatoxins and so forth and i wanted to know how that developed like why are you so into them and 
I have an attraction to danger, <laughs> maybe. And, uh, and I, I just, the thought of eating an Amanita when I was just starting out was just so, I mean, not, of course, eating a toxic Amanita, but the thought of eating an Amanita that, that, that had that potential to be so dangerous just fascinated me. So I like a challenge. Um, and they just hooked me. They did, the mushrooms just hooked me. And the Amanitas were my hook to start studying fungi. So it was the desire to eat a cockero, which is one of our beautiful, um, delicious <laughs> local species. I'll try to find one in this book and show you. Um, so these are cockeros, right, in the little David Aurora book. I and, think I just learned how to pronounce that correctly. Yeah, so so I really <laughs> wanted to eat this and I really didn't want to die. So that is what kind of spurred me into studying mycology. And now I've gone far beyond just wanting to add eating amanitas, but um, that's what it really intrigued me. And they're beautiful, interesting species all over the world. They they so some are deadly, some of the most choice edible species are amanitas worldwide and they take you sideways too so mushrooms like muscaria are actually entheogens and and they, they they're not hallucinatory like a psilocybin but they definitely alter your brain chemistry so there's something for everyone in the genus amanita so cool so if you um there must be people who are curious about hunting mushrooms and learning more about them. If What would you say to people about getting started if you wanted to go look for chanterelles and you're scared of death caps? And... Right, well, so, so anyone can go into the woods and look for mushrooms. And it's a great idea when to bring a basket. And if you see something curious, dig it up, take it home, study it. Um, there's lots of great books. So this is this is way out of date, but it is still an absolutely fabulous beginner's book by David Aurora. You can see it's, it has a lot of years on it, All That the Rain Promises and More. So it's got, it's just got easy pictures and easy descriptions and all kind of talks about all the cool people, cool and unusual people that like to hunt mushrooms. And it gives you most of the prominent species you would see in this area. And you can stick it in the back of your jean pocket. So it's just like a one-stop shop. So another great book for our Bay Area is Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast. Um, but it's a deep dive. So I don't really recommend it so much if you're a beginner. And then our third recent great guide is California Mushrooms. Um, and this will actually get you up into the Sierra because there's lots of mushroom habitats. It's not just in the Bay Area. So go out, collect, take pictures, post them. Mushroom Observer and INAT are two great sites where you can put your pictures up and get back your IDs. But try to do it yourself too, because that's the fun. Illustrating mushrooms is a great way to learn features. That's how I started before I even had a camera. I illustrated everything I found. Um, ask questions of people that know more than you. Join a mycological society. When I first was starting out, I think there were two societies, the MSSF and SOMA and the FFSC down in Santa Cruz. Now they're, they're springing up like mushrooms everywhere. So there's no excuse. If you want to learn, there's so many resources you can use to learn and do it safely, but don't eat what you don't know. Don't go out in the woods thinking, I'm going to get dinner. Go out in the woods thinking, I'm going to learn about mushrooms so that down the line, I can safely gather my dinner. Mm -hmm. I'm among the people who have um, collect, I would used to just collect a little bit of everything I saw and then try to do spore prints. And my husband, who's not a mu mushroom person, would, you know, pa patiently have to endure, you know, the spore prints overnight. There's like mushrooms on every surface in the tiny house and <laughs> none of them get eaten unless the key can be completely, you know, perfectly identified. 
<laughs> so um, I, it's a long journey, but a rewarding one for it those is. who start realizing how much diversity there is in the woods. Yeah, there, and there's um, more. What about foraging? What about I want to ask about foraging because you mentioned, you know, in the Bay Area, that like there's a lot of rules <laughs> and there's a lot of people. So, what are your feelings about it at this point? Well, it's at the Bay Area is a are there just way to be a, a forager because most of the wild places it's illegal to collect mushrooms, just like they don't want you collecting the plants, they pretty much equate fungi with plants, which really isn't fair. But until we can change the land manager opinion, um, you are taking a risk collecting fungi in the East Bay Regional Park District. Um, my old friend, Larry Stickney, who is one of the co-founders of both the MSSF, the oldest mushroom society in the Bay Area, and the NAMA Society, which is uh, the umbrella organization for the whole nation, um, was busted collecting chanterelles in Redwood Regional Park, and he had to pay a $600 fine. And this was 20, Ooh. 30 years ago. Oh, Ouch. man. Yeah. 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 So, we uh, had a couple... Yeah, go ahead. We had a couple other questions. Um, are the death caps dangerous to touch or just to ingest? They are not dangerous to touch. Um, you have to ingest them for them to be dangerous and, um, and you have to you... enough of them too so i mean i suppose you could do a taste and spit nothing would happen but you don't want to you don't want to test that line right just don't eat them yeah oh yeah yeah and then what should you look for in identification tips for chanterelles um oh, well the most important yeah. uh, thing is to get into the habitat right so here in the bay area it's coast live oak and then sometimes they're not obvious. So you might need to kick the duff around a little bit or take a walking stick and move the duff around. Look for that little gleam of gold in the duff. And then once you find one, you know, push things around until you find others. And then once you do harvest, cover up your hole and, you know, be kind to the mycelia that made you that gift of a mushroom. Yeah, and maybe don't eat, don't take them all, right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, that it depends on, so there's people that commercial forage in the Bay Area too, but they don't see, they can't mm -hmm. sell all the ones. So they can't sell the little tiny ones. You don't want to get the little tiny ones. So, so it, by the time they're really big, they've been shedding spores and their, their work is done and you don't have to feel guilty about taking them home. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's tough to forage in the Bay Area. Because it, for sure, you know, if everybody in the Bay Area was collecting mushrooms, it would not be good. Just the trampling alone, right? We have yeah. too many people, yeah. even though we have wonderful green belts here. Yeah, we did. Um, we did a story on Matsutakis in the fall, and uh, by a Karuk woman who talked about how to be a good, responsible gatherer, and that that's probably worth looking up if you're really new to foraging um just to, like it's the a lot of the having good manners in the field kind of stuff like don't take everything you see and don't ruin the habitat and you know <laughs> think about walk your lightly giving some you can, some take, you can take um walk on animal tracks right rather than breaking your own and uh it doesn't hurt to thank the mushrooms you know what does it hurt right be polite out there I love that. And I'll leave it there for today. Um, I want to say thank you again to Debbie. Um, this has been so fun. Thank you for sharing your expertise and your passion with the Bay Nature community. Um, we really appreciate it and look forward to keeping our eyes open for more of our spectacular fungal friends. Maybe we would get out on the trail with you in the future, I hope. That'd be fun. And I want to thank everybody who came. Um, for this conversation and thank you for donating. Thank you, thank you for attending. In the coming days, we're gonna send around an email um, with a link to the recording. And I hope we also can include some of Debbie's links to the Facebook group and other helpful um, mushroom related information. Um, so thank you everyone and see you next time.
Bye.